Is the defense ready to call its next witness? Yes, Your Honor. <clears throat> we call Charlie Adelson. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth? I do, sir. You may take your seat. Charlie, let's start with the most important question. Did you cause the death of Professor Dan Markell? Absolutely no. Did you hire anyone to kill him? No. Spend some time on your background. How old are you? I'm 47 years old. Where were you raised? I was raised in Coral Springs, Florida. And by the way, are you, are you? how do you feel right now? I'm really nervous. Why are you nervous? My, my whole life depends on it. Your family growing up, would you describe it? How would you describe it financially? Um, I'd say it was upper middle class. And then in 92, my dad lost a lot of money. And then uh wasn't upper middle class after that. And then my, my dad worked hard and he worked until he was 78. He retired. You are listening to the Roberta Glass True Crime Report, putting the true back in true crime. From New York City, Roberta Glass is now on the record. Hello, everyone. So as per my boyfriend's request, I was just going to watch the some of the STS interview with Daniel Rashbaum. Donna and Harvey's lawyer originally, then he became Charlie Adelson's lawyer, and now he's back to representing... The fancy lady herself. The fancy lady. Donna. And I just turned to it for a second. Just kind of sped through it because if you've watched the Surviving the Surviving podcast, you know that there's so much promotion in it. So I just wanted to speed past all the promotion and get to the interview. And I get right to the point where he's calling Donna very loving. So this accused murderess is very loving. I guess as long as you're on her good side. She's very loving to Rashi. Unreal. So I thought we'd watch it. You know, I was asked if he'd come on my podcast or I'd have him on. And I really don't think that's the question. Of course, I would have him on. I would ask him a ton of tough questions. And that's why he never would be on my podcast. My experience, I have been speaking out against a multi-billion dollar movement, wrongful conviction movement for so long. And I've asked so many people in the movement from Sister Helen Prajean to Jason Flom on for a really civil discussion. And it's always crickets. Even in the case of Jason Flom, who has the wrongful conviction podcast, his money helped build the Innocence Project. That guy, his PR contacted me to come on my podcast. I said, great, I'd love to have him on. And uh, they were like, great, let me just circle in someone higher up. So once that person was circled in, I never heard back from him again. So I would think that Rashbaum would be a similar situation. And isn't it interesting... Last time I was talking about Surviving the Survivor podcast, I was talking about the way that they spoke about Carl Steinbeck, who has the Jury Trial Mentor channel on YouTube. And I 
wasn't too pleased with the way that they were framing their disagreement where I felt that Carl was just asking questions and instead I felt, and I think you can see it if you watch it, I, I think this is actually a fact, that they're framing it like Carl Steinbeck is so emotional and like it's something wrong with his character. Not that he's asking questions that they don't want to answer. It's that there's something wrong with Carl. I found that very manipulative and not so great. I think I burned my bridges with this, <laughs> with the STS podcast. Um, and, you know, Joel, he comes from mainstream media and the episodes I've seen, I think he had on a woman who freed a guy who pled guilty. He pled guilty and got out. And I believe it was an Alfred plea, which is legally a guilty plea. So they're going to, of course, put that, you know, way down. And there, it was all about his innocence. So I would frame that in, in, in the same category as innocence fraud. I'm not an expert on that case. I've just read a little bit about it. But anytime anybody pleads guilty to get out, you should raise an eyebrow. Wilson was sentenced to life in prison without parole. This Monday, Donna Adelson heads back to court. As it appears, she is desperate for her trial to begin. And tonight, we have the distinct pleasure and honor of being joined by her and Charlie Adelson's lead defense counsel, Daniel Rashbaum. Dan, how are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. Thank you for joining us. A couple of quick things I just want to point out. Number one, it's already getting some hate mail. Uh, Dan is an attorney. Yeah, no, I have no problem with you having Rashbaum on. That's not the issue. It's how you how you handle it. If it's a softball interview, then yeah. Then you're just letting your channel become a promotion for the Adelson family. So let's see how it goes. Let's see if tough questions are asked. Let's see where it goes. But I have no issue with having someone like this on. And I think that there should be more discussions amongst true crime people and, and these people who are such mysteries who rarely give interviews. And I know everyone deserves a defense, but is a defense saying that the person is so loving? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Attorney, that is his job. That is his profession. Uh, we may not all like the clients he represents, uh, but please be respectful as I will be. I reached out to Ruth Markell, spoke with Phil and Shelly as well through her, uh, and uh, they are well aware that this interview is taking place tonight. Uh, it is important for me. Um, as What do you mean you reached out? What are you reaching out to the Markell family for? So this looks like to me, like I'm going to use the Markel name to rubber stamp. I'm sorry. Maybe this is really too harsh, but this is really how I see it. I'm not holding back tonight, but I'm going to use the Markel name to blanket myself and say, that, well, they're well aware. Does that mean they're encouraging you to do it? Approve. Uh, th that means it has their stamp of approval. No one's asking you to do that. If he wants to have the Markel family on and Rashburn <laughs> on at the same time, I mean, what are you talking about? I wouldn't want to put them through it. I'm not saying that he should. But I mean, like, what is the point of that? This is the stuff I do not like STS doing. It feels very manipulative to me. That's that's how I see it. As a, as a journalist and doing advocacy journalism, uh, to make sure that they were in the loop on this. Uh, Dan is unable to get into a lot of the details. Okay, so it's not advocacy journalism, but he can't get into a lot of the details of the case. So does that mean he's handling Charlie's appeal or what here? I'm going to try not to be so sour. Sorry, guys. This is just the kind of true crime reporting that 
I'm not crazy about MW. Thank you very much. Donna will be at the airport. Donna. Is that what she was thinking? There was that walk with that big footed walk. Oh, Rashi, Rashbaum. He'll save me. My Rashi will save this fancy lady. Yeah. Oh, thanks, MW, for putting me in a really little bit of a better mood there. Hope you guys can keep me from being totally sour on this. But yeah, this is the kind of true crime reporting that I find very morally vague. And already they're going to cloak themselves in the victim's family. And he can't get into the details. I, you know, let's see what, let's see what's asked. Let's see what questions are asked. That's really the difference here. Details regarding Charlie Adelson because of the pending appeal. That doesn't mean I'm not going to ask him a couple of things and he can tell me to buzz off and uh, I will be respectful of that. Otherwise, zero stipulations uh, in place. Dan Rashbaum actually said to me. me ask me whatever you want take as much time uh, as you need so he's been uh, really great in that regard like a debate however i'm going to ask dan to try to answer the questions defense attorneys have a habit of talking uh, in a reasonable amount of time and uh, that's because uh, i've got a lot of questions and a lot of a lot of ground i want to cover uh, with that said i do have a couple of patreon member questions in here and the coe is going to be all over this so she will take um, some questions once we get into the swing of things uh, from STS Nation. A reminder, 7 p.m. Eastern time, uh, we're going to do some react. Sorry. Yeah, I was just saying that when he said that he can tell me to buzz off, Rashbaum's like looking, his smile just dropped. So is this going to be a tough interview? Is he all of a sudden worried that this might be a tough interview? Kind of interesting little moment there when he said, I'm going to ask questions about Charlie Adelson anyway, and he can tell me to buzz off. So good for Joel there. Let's see what he comes up with. Action to this interview with Tim Jansen and Jared Ross, both Tallahassee attorneys. Jared was a friend of Wendy and Dan and actually went to high school with Charlie. And a quick reminder for Patreon and YouTube members, Dateline watch party Friday night. The details, I have no idea. The COE will tell you, uh, Dan Markell. Will be yeah that's something i might be doing watching the dateline thing on my kick channel uh if i do do that on friday on my day off because i'll be watching it anyway uh i'll put the my kick channel address in the community chat so look for that if i choose to do that probably will i, I doing it anyway i'll be watching it anyway it's be in that episode as far as uh, i know but uh dan just want to start off again by thanking you for being here and uh do you have a message you would like to send to the markel family i believe you tried to talk to them at the trials didn't really have time um wondering what that message might be well i, I never tried to talk to them because i i, I respect their privacy uh you know for years i was a federal prosecutor uh, doing violent crime cases and crimes against children. And my, my clients. That is interesting. So you went to the dark side. So if you don't know, prosecutors, it's often public what they make in a, make a year. At least in California, it is usually a couple hundred thousand dollars. It's not chump change by any means, but it's nowhere in the, vicinity of what these defense attorneys make. And the fact that he hitched his wagon to Josh Dubin makes me extremely, extremely wary of him. Not just hitched his wagon to the Adelson family, but I know what that, you know, I, I've been studying that movement of which, which he comes from, and it's very dark. 
So now he's going to say, so he, he went from working for victims, working for the public, securing, making sure that we're all safe by putting away people who are dangerous, he said, in federal crimes. Interesting. I would love, I could not find a case. If anybody can find a case, let me know. And I'll try to stop, stop interrupting this every two minutes. Let me know if you can find a case that Rashbaum tried. He boasts that he never lost a case federally. So let's see. I, that's interesting. This is all news to me. Very interesting. At that time, were victims. So I'm very respectful of victims. And I tried to be respectful of the Markells uh, during the trial because while the trial wasn't about them, um, you always have to be respectful of victims. They're going through a terrible time, terrible situation. And so I never wanted to to offend them in any way. And I really, who is the crime of who is the what is the trial about? If it's not about Dan Markell and his family. It's about Charlie. I guess you'd say it's about Charlie Adelson's guilt. But I guess on my side of the aisle, it's so much more about seeing justice for them. Interesting. Really interesting. Very telling. And I hope I did it. Um, did Donna and or Charlie ever express any remorse, any guilt, anything uh, toward you about the Markell family? So again, I can't divulge anything that they would have told me directly uh, because that's pretty. Yeah, Joe should know that that's lawyer client privilege. Thank you so much. Veronica Sawyer for the super sticker. Appreciate it very much. And I appreciate everybody who's here. I feel like we're all in a support group. <laughs> I really do. Because I can really get very, very upset. These kind of things. I don't know. I, if you know my story, um, you know why I talk about true crime from this perspective. Um, I was in a fire in 2012. And it was just internal injuries. I wasn't but I was in a coma for six weeks. I was in the burn unit for seven and I had a very long recovery. So after that, I'm very sensitive to the victims and what it, what it, what that all means. And I've done a lot of podcasts with victims, family members. So that's, that's kind of where I come from. Privileged. Um, but what I can tell is that, um, they, they always felt bad for the family, of course, because they lost their son. Um, beyond bad, I mean, was there was there a sense of remorse uh, that this person died? Uh, did they ever indicate to you, and I know you're not going to be able to answer some of this stuff, that they had a hand in doing this? So, uh, no, the opposite um, as far as having a hand in doing this. Um, but, of course, there's remorse because they're watching. Of course, there's remorse. These are good questions. That's a good question, Joel. Very good question. And I'm surprised he's answering it. Another lawyer would say, I can't divulge anything that they said to me. I can't even divulge their attitude. But we saw Charlie on the stand. Did he, did he, did it scream remorse to you? Obviously he's maintaining his innocence. So it's not. But we saw him at the sentencing, and that's when you can re express remorse. A lot of people think you can't and still maintain your innocence. But again, it was all about himself. Remember, he said, he, I, I'm innocent, wrongfully convicted, LOL. So that's a good question. Watching their grandchildren and their nephews grow up without a father. And so every day was a reminder of what had happened to Danny, um, to Professor Markell. But uh, as far as anything they told me, I can't reveal that, obviously. You know, uh, the bar mitzvah was this past weekend. Did you have a chance to attend that? No, I did not attend the bar mitzvah. During not. that, uh, Wendy Adelson uh, referred to Abba in a very sort of strange way. A lot of people thought it was bizarre. 
Uh, any idea why she invoked Dan's name, a guy that she was very openly uh, hateful of? I wasn't at the bar mitzvah, and I, I'm not sure what you're referring to. I don't like kosher style food, so I, I wasn't going to go. I, I RSVP'd no to that, Joel. Sorry. <laughs> what? By the way, don't know what I'm going to do about the Super Bowl. We're having a Super Bowl party over here. Speaking of kosher style food, and we're having some guests over who who keep kosher. So I'm so I think we're going to be getting some real real kosher food, not kosher style. So I don't know what I'm going to do for that. Maybe pre-record something. I I don't know. Um, but um, what I can say is. I think uh, there's no winning in this situation for the Adelsons. If she had said nothing at the bar mitzvah about Professor Markel, I'm sure she would have been criticized. If she said something at the bar mitzvah, and again, I don't know what it was. I wasn't there. I haven't heard it. Um, but if she said anything at the bar mitzvah about him, then I'm sure she's going to be criticized and nitpicked as to anything she said. So I, I don't know what she said. I don't know if anything was said, um, but, um, but th that would be my response to that. And since I know you can't really speak uh, a lot, if at all, about Charlie Adelson, because uh, that case, uh, there's an appeal pending. Um, you know, people here obviously know a, a very high profile case. Charlie Adelson is on trial. Uh, the jury goes back to deliberate. It's three hours or less. Guilty verdict. Um, not a good outcome for, for him. Why is Donna Adelson hiring you, uh, do you think, after this pretty um, brutal loss? Uh, that I'm not sure. Uh, I think she knows how well prepared we were, um, how hard we fought. Um, and I'd like to think she trusts me. Um, but uh, I guess that would be a question for her one day. Right. Um, so I, I couldn't tell you more than that. I'm going to start to uh, mix in questions in a little bit, but I just want to get uh, some of this stuff out of. Yeah, I think anything other than. Wendy's saying I did it and throwing herself on the mercy of the court is going to be criticized by this community and her smugness and her arrogance, her egotism, her coldness, her, 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 her straight up what I'd see as antisocial personality I mean, there's just no excuse for, for changing the kids' names, for barring the Markells from her children's life. It's not even good for her kids. But the Adelsons are so arrogant that they see it like, well, we're, we have all the advantages. We're rich. Our family will provide everything that these boys need, and they will be out of the clutches Right, we save them from the clutches of a religious zealot. That's a really key element in this story. And if you see it through the Adelson's point of view, Dan Markell was dangerous. Not that they, it's really almost like a projection, really, but they saw him as dangerous, that his religion was dangerous, that he was a zealot. And a zealot cannot be reasoned with cannot be bargained with you can't you can't go back tit for tat with negotiate with right you can't negotiate with terrorists you can't negotiate with religious zealots so in their mind they save these boys so i mean it's ridiculous we know the truth any kind of soul they just very soulless so in replace of any kind of spirituality, I would say this family worships money and power and status. Okay, I've only gotten like five seconds into this. I'm going to let it run a little bit. Of the way here, and then we will give STS Nation a chance. Again, we're talking to Dan Rashbaum, uh, the attorney for Charlie Adelson and Donna Adelson. Um Dan, do you know why Charlie has not been moved out of Chipley yet in the panhandle? He's still in that reception area. We were told because, uh, you know, he's got to be in uh, basically, uh, you know, special unit and that there's not an opening in that unit. Can you confirm that? I, I don't know one way or the other. Have you talked to him recently? 
Uh, I've talked to him one time uh, since he uh, was moved. But again, he has a, another lawyer now who's handling his case, who I'm sure has talked to him several times. Um, who told Charlie, do you have any idea about Donna's arrest? And do you know how he took that? Um, I'm trying to think the timing. I'm sure... I'm sure I would have told. See, I would, would be asking right away, why did you think Charlie Adelson did so well in the stand? Did you give him a 95 out of 100? Is that true? I don't know if that goes into lawyer-client privilege, but since Charlie let it spell on a recorded line, I think he could answer that. I hope he asked those questions. Those are the things I'd want to know. Sorry, I said I was going <laughs> to let it roll. And here I am running my mouth. Okay, back. Charlie about it, because I think I was, it, it happened before her sentence, before the sentencing. Uh, so I'm sure I, I would have uh, told him about that. Uh, I don't think he was overly surprised. He wasn't. I mean, was he uh, upset? It, was, he, was he remorseful about that? Did he indicate any sort of guilt that maybe his actions had a part in her demise now and being behind bars again without talking about specific conversations what i can tell you is he was upset obviously that his mom had been arrested yes uh was he mad at himself or was he mad at the markels or was he mad at the system he did well come on what is it what are these questions are you mad that your mother got arrested are you mad at yourself they, they you know i can answer that hey joel i can answer that these people take zero responsibility. It's Tallahassee's fault. A hundred, you know, Tallahassee's fault, Georgia Kappelman's fault, everybody's fault, but them, but themselves. I, I, I you know what? I, I think I could give a more compelling interview as in a Daniel Rashbaum imitation than Daniel Rashbaum. I'll just sit there. I'll sniff my fingers I'll, I'll kind of go back and forth. I mean, I think he's asked fairly. And I think that's what makes him so dangerous is that he comes across as like a rat, like very likable guy. But I'd be asking about Josh Dubin. Do you think you got your money's worth for the money that you paid out? Do you think the jury, uh, Charlie Adelson has said the jury was the problem. Do you think the jury was the problem? Why do you think you lost that that case? These are all things I'd want to know, but let's see if Joel asked them. He didn't really indicate one or the other. He was just upset that his mom was going through this. Obviously, he knew what she was about to encounter, although I think what she encountered was a lot worse than what his situation was in the beginning. I mean, at any point, during your working with him, did he ever tell you he felt bad about? Why does he think Donna has it worse? And I would say, what did you, I, I said, do you feel that you crossed the line when you advise Donna? It's out there recorded. You can't say it's a privileged communication. It's out there for the whole world to hear. Dan or Daniel Rashi says that we might not make it out. Do you think you crossed the line as a lawyer by advising Donna and Harvey on fleeing? That's what I'd be asking. Isn't it interesting? I mean, maybe this is why his podcast is so popular and is because these are the questions people want to know, but uh, I tell you, they're not, they're not the the pressing questions I want to know about what happened. Of course, of course. And, did, and at any point did he tell you he felt bad because he did it, or, or at least he organized uh, this hit? No, he never told you that at any point, not in a weak moment of time or anything. No. Joel, he's not going to say it, even if he did. He can't say it. You have to know that. So the, here's Joel pretending he's asking tough questions. He has to know that he has lawyer-client privilege, that that would be a dereliction of duty for Rashbaum to come out and say, oh, yeah, he told me everything. He told me he did it, and he feels badly. 
what are we doing here? What is this? What is this? What is this? Was What are we watching here? He knows he can't answer those questions honestly, even if he did. Am I, am I insane? Am I, am I losing my mind here? What am I watching? I might spontaneously combust watching this. <laughs> no. Uh, Lee Dundee, uh, how is Donna doing in jail? Uh, I think she's doing better now. Um, she's in uh, general population. We're able to work. Um, she has clothes on. She's able to have a shower every day. Um, she's able to brush her teeth every day. So I think she's doing a lot better than she was before. She has clothes on. Yeah, she's doing a lot better than when she was lying naked in her cell, singing to herself. <laughs> what are you talking about? So now he's going with this narrative that Donna was terribly treated. Now she can brush her teeth. Do they not give you a toothbrush for, on watch for fear that you'll do something? So he's going with this rights violated narrative with a straight face with his p -p -p poker face. <laughs> oh, society page, please do a poker face thing with Rashbaum. I beg, I beg, <laughs> you know, Rashbaum was a poker player, but he's answering these questions kind of well for, this is what you have to do if you're a defense lawyer. And I love what John Lewin said to me about being a defense lawyer. He said, if I wanted to say things I didn't mean, I'd be a defense attorney. Um, question we got from a lot of people, and I mean this with all due respect, but uh, why are you here today, Dan? Uh, I'm here because a lot of people have questions. And frankly, there's a lot of misinformation out there. And so I figure... Rather than uh, have the misinformation out there, I give people uh, the ability to ask me questions, and I'll try to answer them to the ability I can. Obviously, what's the misinformation? Or if it's or misinformation means a lot of opinions I don't like about myself and about my clients. He's here to do PR for his client. And unless you press him, about what this misinformation is, you're propping him up. Joel, please ask the follow-up question. What misinformation? Please. I can't talk about privileged conversations and I can't talk directly about Charlie's case. Um, so that's why I'm here. Um, there's, there is a lot of skepticism that you're trying to uh, spin a narrative. And a lot of that comes from the fact that when Katie's proffer was out there, um, you were adamantly against any, you just didn't want any media around uh, at all. Why change your tune now? Why appeal to the media? Charlie's defense was uh, very important for us to keep it quiet. It was very important that, uh, that the government not know what his defense was. That was our, that was our strategy and it worked. Um, and so we took the position that we were not going to go out and- That was our strategy and it worked. He got convicted in three hours. <laughs> Does he still think he won? He's as deluded as his clients. No wonder they love him. That was our strategy and it worked. So did Rashbaum go reach out to STS? That's what I want to know. Now I want to interview Joel more than uh, more than Rashbaum now. Now I want to know what how this whole thing came to be. Pretty interesting. Media, we were not going to advocate our defense. We were going to wait for trial. That that was our position then and that's why we acted as we did during Charlie's trial. Obviously, Donna's situation is different because there's already been a trial of an Adelson. Um, and so the situation is different. But it was very important to us for Charlie's defense to to be one that was uh, that was revealed at trial. Uh, Marcy wants no part of STS Nation. By the way, Dan, I would say best guest, which you are one now, but better community. We have the best community, not only in true crime, 
but all of the YouTubes. And by the way, you did a fantastic job uh, getting yourself lit up with that ring light we <laughs> sent you and uh, get yourself on here because uh, Dan claims to be technically illiterate as me, which is hard to believe. But from Marcy, is Mr. Rashbaum advising Wendy? So they're sending him ring lights because they want him to look well lit and they want to make him look the best he could look. I mean, you could say that, I don't know. I don't, I off there. There have been times when I've offered to send someone who I'm interviewing, you know, Apple headphones cause they have a pretty decent microphone, but I don't know. I get that you want your show to look decent, but I don't know. I don't know. That may be crossing the line there. Dean Harvey, are either of them your clients in any capacity? No. I, I've only met Wendy Edelson, I think, once or twice now, including the trial in my life. Uh, Mrs. Jim Morrison, uh, she must be wealthy off all the licensing. Please ask, Dan, why no change of venue? I'm assuming... Why no change of venue? Uh, so what I'm saying is that you're actually helping them look good. I get that it's your show. I get it. It's just, let me sleep on it. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm overreacting because Rashbaum, my head is just scrambled because Rashbaum just said that his defense strategy worked. So, um, you know, you're literally making making your guest look good. And we'll see by the kind of interview that it is. I mean, why no change of venue? Because because the judge said no. That's why. What are these questions? Why pick that one? And she is meeting for the Charlie Adelson trial because we are not even at the point of requesting that with Donna. Uh, did you think about a change of venue uh, with the Charlie Adelson trial, a request of change of venue? We moved for a change of venue in Charlie's case, and it was denied. Uh, STS is so good. They're going to sidetrack me. And this is precisely why I was going to wait, but I'm going to mix them in here because uh, I can tell the pacing is good. Dan Rashbaum, uh, heeding my wishes about being like a uh, political debate. He's answering me and giving me uh nice quick answers. Um, Chloe's mom, how come Harvey and Donna never talked to the police right after Dan died? Um, you know, uh, there was a contentious divorce going on, but someone was murdered here. Great question, Chloe's mom. That's a good question. And let's see him answer this lawyerly. It was their right. How do you answer that? Good question, Chloe's mom. Here, you think that they'd want to help. Why didn't they? They did talk to the police, um, uh, both before the memorial service and after the memorial service, and they were never contacted again. Oh, so see, this is why I don't like him. This is a lie. So they may have contacted the police when the police called them. So, that, I mean, they made contact. See, this, see where you got to think like Clinton, <laughs> Clinton lawyerly. They did make contact in the same way that Wendy Adelson didn't drive by the crime scene because it was she couldn't drive by it. She drove up to it. So they got on the phone. Donna said, so she, they got called. Maybe they missed it or whatever. Donna may have called back. So that may have made the contact. But I don't think so. It seems like he's going to lie blatantly for his client. And they said that Donna pretended like it was a bad, bad cell connection. You know, like you see on these comedy shows, like bad cell connection. Sorry. You know, throw the phone out the window. And Wendy practically hung up on him. This is the PR I was reading from 2016. This is like the same PR that they've been putting out forever and ever. And unless STS is going to push back and say, no, we know that to be untrue. Are you calling the police a liar? Great question, though, Chloe's mom. Tell us uh, what happened uh, in that. Was that an official? That was not a sit down with Don and Harvey at the police department, was it? They reached out to the detective and then the detective talked to them. I believe it was either during or right after the memorial service. Uh, and then they were never reached out to again.
Wendy was reached out to. Uh, we can tell that from the records. Um, so your clients were dying to participate. It was just Wendy. See now how Wendy's becoming the fall person because it's not his client. They reached out, meaning, sorry, the <clears throat> hi, this is Donna. Oh, the, the cell reception is really bad. Sorry. Oh, Isom. Uh, Isom, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to call you back. That's her reaching out. Wendy, same kind of thing. Practically so quick. If you want to call that reaching out, they were never, they were never, they were never, they never tried to contact them again. And Joel's not pushing back on this. He's saying, no, well, the police tell a different story. Are you saying the police are, are lying? What are you saying? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but, but Donna and Harvey were never reached out to again. Uh, do we know why? Is it, it was it because they weren't responding to requests for police interviews or it was that they were not asked? They were never asked. Now, you, you'd have to ask uh, the detective about that, but um, they reached. This is a pattern. So uh, the, one of the reasons why we can know this is untrue. Hold on, I have to cough. Is that Donna and Harvey, before Charlie Adelson's trial, There's a le there's a legal document where they're talking about how if they were called, they would take the fifth and there should be no mentioning in the trial of this fact that they basically refuse to answer any questions on the stand. So if they're refusing to answer questions under the on the stand, uh, given a subpoena, then they are, I don't know you know, called basically, I don't know if they were given a subpoena, but they were requests. I didn't even know if it got that formal. Help me out in the audience. I'm for, I'm really getting kind of fuzzy on how it went down, but it, they basically fought it. Wendy fought it in the same way the first time until she was given immunity. It was assured and worked out. And so that's how we know it to be untrue. It's the same resistance. I, in putting away Rivera or, or Katie. I know it's different when it's your own family, but similar kind of thing. Like we're not gonna, and you know that the whole family is very close. So if one of them figured out one of them was a killer, they, they are all staying together, which lets us know they're all conspirators. I'm sorry. Is this going too slowly? Shout initially uh, for protection um, uh, before the memorial service. And then uh, they spoke to Detective Isom shortly, I believe, after or during the service. And then they were never contacted again. Uh, I was there for this from Bossy, Texas Chick. And then I'm going to get back to some of my stuff and we'll mix it all in. We'll, we'll weave uh, a tangled web, as Alec Murdoch said in his trial, uh, Rewatched uh, the closing, your closing, Dan Rashbaum, in honor of your guest appearance today, and was wondering uh, if you wish you hadn't said, I hate when murderers come into this courtroom and lie. Uh, do you think that hurt your case? Was that a misstep of a line in a closing argument? I don't remember saying it. I'm sure <laughs> I did. Uh, I haven't watched my uh, closing. Oh, bossy Texas chick. Shout out to you. Here's a channel I really like. I don't always agree with her, but she always gives me something to think about. Shout out to you, bossy Texas chick. Uh, the guest, the the audience is asking much better questions than than Joel. I hate when murderers come into the court and lie. Mm, I don't remember him saying that in closing either. That's interesting. Do you guys remember that? Closing again, but no, I meant it. I meant it. Um, Katie Magbanoa, anyone who watched that trial and anyone who's seen her proffers knows she's a liar. And going back to your question a couple moments ago, if you recall uh, when the proffers uh, were turned over to the lawyers, I said in court, these proffers are not bad for us. And they weren't. And now th th all the all the YouTube universe thought I was lying. I wasn't. Right. Um, so, uh, no, I, I don't regret saying it. 
I don't think it changed the outcome of the case or hurt the case. Uh, and I meant it. You're going to appear on. Why do I have sour grapes? See Malone? Because I didn't have Rashi on? Or Rashi won't come on? Because I'm jealous of STS? Why? Curious. On uh, Dateline tomorrow night, we're having our own little watch party for Patreon and YouTube members of uh, the COE and the mods will let you know about that. Um, is this the beginning of some sort of media PR campaign? Because, uh, you know, if we're being honest, um, Charlie's not a very popular guy. And I believe that's probably the reason he is being held at Chipley because he has to go into a secure uh, pod at a state prison. Otherwise, he could be in danger. Um, do you have to, uh, is part of your job as a defense attorney to, um, not make Don Adelson as low despised and abhorred as Charlie Adelson currently is? Uh, I mean, look, I think that uh, the world sees these people through a particular lens. I understand why they see them through the lens, but the reality is they don't know Donna Adelson. Um, they haven't been in a room with her. They haven't spent time with her. They don't know what type of person she is. And so um, they're assuming certain things. And uh, many of those things are just completely false. Um, can can you so, give us an example? Can you give us a couple of examples? Look, I, I've spent uh, a considerable amount with, of time with Donna over the years. Yay. Yay, Joel. Finally. Finally a follow-up. Yay. That's excellent. Can you – that's just what I wanted to know. Where? Where? What is the – misinformation and just like i've just noticed that this that the movement that you know via dubin that he's attaching himself to does this kind of stuff they lie by omission they throw out things like misinformation and that's not misinformation so he's saying that he's saying that donna adelson is being mischaracterized i wouldn't Put that as misinformation, but okay. I guess that's what you have to do as a defense attorney. But good for Joel for 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 asking. That's the question I want to know. Good for him. She is caring, loving. Um, she is probably the most polite client I've ever had in 25 years of doing this. Uh, she's bright, but um, not analytical. Um She's kind. She's not analytical. I shoot from the hip. I shoot from the hip. That's right, Rashi. I shoot from the hip. I'm very loving. I make him banana bread all the time. I give him hugs, especially with the, I just like I did to my ex son in law that I had murdered. <laughs> what? what? How do these people, how do they, how do they sleep at night? I know how they sleep at night on a pile full of, of money, <laughs> but come on. How do they do this with a straight face? Amazing. She's loving. Uh, she's very polite to the people she doesn't want to murder guys. Very polite. And what she's not telling, she's not suggesting that her daughter dress up her kids in Hitler youth outfits. She's incredibly caring and she's sharp. She's sharp as a whip, not analytical. She's got emotional intelligence. <laughs> what are we talking about? Oh. <laughs> I would have done. Kind. Um, she's someone I like. <laughs> She's someone I care about. I would go so far to say that. Um, and that's that. Oh, Donna, Raz, she loves you. It's a love affair. You know what I mean? I'm expecting them to do. You're the one that I want. Woo -hoo -hoo. You're the one that I want, Rashi. <laughs> that's, I mean, what a love affair between these two clients. She's very polite and she's so loving. And that banana bread is delicious, guys. That's odd for me in representing a client. Um, uh, but in general, what I would say to you is uh, this is a different case, right? With different 
viewpoints and different reasons why uh, I'm willing to answer questions about Donna. Um, because mm-hmm. I think there's there's so much there's look, there's so much out there in the seven plus years of the media covering this, um, more particularly the YouTube media and the podcasters. Uh Oh, it's the podcasters fault, guys. I don't think he likes this channel too much, guys. He doesn't like Donna's characterization that she's involved in a murder. He doesn't like it. He doesn't like this channel, guys. See? See? They always put out stuff like that, Carl Malone. They don't want to explain. They just want to, like, throw out dispersions that they can't back up. Come on. Let's have a discussion. Tell me why it's sour grapes. Come on. Um, that frankly have already uh, convicted these people. They're presumed guilty um, in the public's eyes, not presumed innocent. And so um, I guess I'm up here to try to paint a different picture of them, a picture that I know to be true. I know I know who Donna Adelson is because I, I know I've spent time with her. I, I know her character because I've been with her. I've seen her act in certain ways. Um, and so she's very different than what people assume. Um, and so, you know, to the degree I can paint that picture, I'm happy to do it. Um, I think I told you uh, when you agreed to do this, it's going to be a lose-lose for both of us. People are still not going <laughs> to like you, and they're probably not going to like me. Uh, they're going to say I didn't push. I didn't ask enough questions. Um, but the one thing that remains true is um, I think I have integrity as a journalist, and I think... Oh, well, if you say you do, if you say you do, then then you do, Right. Just just do your thing. Don't don't tell us how great you are. Tell you about your, your integrity. This is the stuff I don't like. Just do your stuff. But show us by actions, Joel. Enough of the self-promotion. Or maybe maybe I am just jealous that he's so good at his <laughs> the self-promotion. Maybe you're right. I think that Dan has uh an ethical um, you know job as his as a defense attorney and it's true you know if you find yourself god forbid in a in a situation where you need a criminal defense attorney um you're going to want someone like a dan rashbaum uh to represent Joel, I'm, you. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt but here here's what i would say to that it shouldn't be a lose-lose for either of us and it's not for me because <laughs> frankly i'm just doing a job right a job that i care very deeply for for six years i was a federal prosecutor and I prosecute. How can you care deeply about murderers? I get that you have to do a job that pays you exceedingly well. It has nothing to do with that, right, Rashi? Nothing to do with the fact that it's cha-ching, that, that it pays like 10 times what, uh, or three times, four times, five times, 10 times. I don't know. Had to be a, a multi-million dollar defense. Charlie Adelson's trial had to ha, you had to make more than a million on that, as opposed to two hundred and forty thousand. Probably you'd see something like that. Maybe even a little less. Maybe a little bit more. I don't know what they're paying prosecutors in Tallahassee. But come on, I get that you're passionate. I get someone has to do it. It's the way, you know, I've had, I've talked to defense attorneys. It's just this kind of defense that's really fast and loose with the truth that I don't have a lot of respect for. There's working with what you have. There's tough cross examinations, but there's, there's I, what I've experienced is there's a different, these, there are different kinds of defense attorneys. And the ones that 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 have the Josh Dubins and and uh, they they seem very comfortable that that are that are advising their clients how to flee the country. I don't have a lot of respect for. I'm sorry. Treated cases as hard as I defend them now. The reality is, Dan Markell believed in our system. Dan Markell believed in the rights of defendants. 
Dan Markell went around and talked about the importance of vigorous defense lawyers, right? And we honor his legacy when we defend people fully, right? The same way that I prosecuted people, I defend people. Okay? I, I try to do so in a professional way. I honor his legacy by lying for his the clients, my clients who murdered him. Well, manner, right? That's why you saw I got along with the prosecutors, right? I try to do it in a professional ma manner, but the way our system works is by... Where I have trouble with you, Rashi, is when you're saying things like they participated in the investigation and it's just the police when you disparage the police and say they didn't do their job the detectives didn't do their job they didn't call them that's my issue with you when you're advising your client on how she could flee the country and get away with this and 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 basically avoid avoid the legal system that you're talking up now yeah, I got a little issue with you, but but so far I don't have a real. I, aside for the way that this started, I don't really think I don't have. I think that the I don't have so much of an issue with the way that Joel conducted this interview. I, I, I'm disappointed. These aren't some of the questions I'd ask, but I don't have. A, I don't like him cloaking himself, like saying that he announcing that he talked to the Markels. I don't like a few of the things in the beginning. But that isn't so much my issue. I think that the that thank heavens for his audience. His audience really came through for him here and asked the better questions. Both sides vigorously representing their clients, right? And so, and th the same goes for journalism. You get to ask the tough questions, and and frankly, when we leave this room. It's not a win loss for either of us because we have wonderful families, we have other cases, and we have other uh, episodes to cover. The reality is we're doing our jobs, and uh, that's a good outlook. Uh, the The bosses here, the the COE, who was telling Dan move forward, move to the left, move to the right, put a little more light on your chin, put more light on your. She couldn't make me uh, good looking. Yeah, when did you start representing Donna and Harvey? The COE wants to know. Um, you you seem to have. Um, and, and this is just in our brief conversations. You you do seem to have an affinity for Donna, like you really truly care about her. Is that from a client uh, relationship, or did you know her prior to this? Uh, when did you all meet? I first met Donna and Harvey Adelson in uh, I would say September or October of 2016. I'd never met, despite what people report online, I'd never met any of the Adelsons before that. The first time I met them was uh, after the probable. R Contrary to rumor, we did not meet in a kosher style swingers club. We met just in totally, <laughs> in totally professional, professional circumstances. I was looking for a, a, some murdering clients, and there they were. Cause affidavit was leaked by the Tallahassee Police Department. I had met them about a month or two later um, when um, it was determined that they needed that uh, that they should get representation. Uh, and that's the first time I met them. Uh, and as far as my affinity for Donna goes, it's true. And I don't know why it is. Um, it could be from the years of representing her. Come on, you know why, Rashi. You know it's my banana bread. You know it's my banana bread. You know it is. <laughs> you know it's my magical banana bread. Everybody loves it. So um, just, this is unreal. What did Dan mean when he said Donna is not analytical? Yeah, great question. That would... I, I would like, you know, I know how it, it's it's a lot harder than it looks to really listen very closely in these interviews and be on camera and manage the chat and do all these things. He does have a team of people behind him, um, but it's it's a lot harder than it looks. You know, I am Monday, just Monday morning quarterbacking a lot on this. 
it's very hard to really keep your ears open and ask those follow-up questions, but that's a great question, Sanyo. Uh, that's a really good question. It's just, I just think, I'm just really disappointed that he didn't, either he didn't know enough to know that that is absolute BS. And it's very interesting that, so, you know, I don't want to start conspiracy theory here, but isn't it interesting that Carl Steinbeck accused STS of being basically a platform for Tim Jansen? I'm not, I don't even know about Tim Jansen. I, I don't have any information whether that's right or wrong, but he did say that Wendy was like, what did he say? Mesmerizing. He was mesmerized by her. What was the word he used? He was wowed by her looks. But isn't it interesting that basically Carl Steinbeck, jury trial mentor, he his accusation of STS was like, how did they know that they were embedded in the defense? And isn't it interesting that Rashbaum comes right to STS and that immediately in the beginning of this, that Joel comes out and says, I talked to the Markell family. They know this is happening as if the Markell family is in any position or has the authority to, to approve or disapprove. Like if they didn't approve, I wouldn't have done this interview. Like they have any say in the programming at STS. So isn't it interesting? Like how did they know? So what Carl Steinbeck was asking is how did STS get the tip that Donna was arrested in the airport? Did they get it from Rashbaum? Did they get it from Jansen? Did they, how did they get it? And it seems like to my mind, it would have had to come from Rashbaum because Rashbaum would have been called right away, tell Charlie, because he was Charlie's lawyer. So what is the real connection here behind the scenes besides sending light rings behind the scenes between SDS and Rashbaum? Instead of really answering that question, Carl Steinbeck's character was maligned as overly emotional and basically as not rational while talking up the just like he's talking up his own ethics and talking up Tim Jansen's own ethics and honesty. He may be, that may be true, but that that's no substitution for answering questions. It could be that she has some similarities to my own mother. Um, I don't know. Um, but I definitely have an affinity for Donna that, um, that I don't usually have in clients. Um, I care for her very much. Um, uh, but, but I first met them in, I guess, in, uh, the fall of 2016. Do, do you speak to her every day right now? We'll, we'll get more into her in a moment, but do you I talk do. to I her speak, every day? I speak with Donna every day. Um, uh, now that she's in general population, uh, and we, we've started working, um, every day, uh, together. Yes. That's a great Great, great window to say, do you feel like your feelings towards Donna have clouded your judgment? Do you feel like you cross the line when you're advising her, her chances of fleeing successfully? Okay, so for, if you don't know what I'm referring to, I'm referring to Donna's jailhouse calls where she said, Rash bound by Rash, she said. She didn't say Rashy, but I'm saying that because I don't like to use this first name because it's too close to Dan Markell's name. Rashy said, we, not, we might not make it out. We might not make it out. We might not do it. So, and other people have weighed in, like Carl Steinbeck, who's a lawyer and said that really crosses an ethical line. I think it does. You know, there are ethical defense attorneys. It's just this kind of defense attorney that I'm not, I'm just not crazy about. 
Has she said anything to you? And I mean this seriously about kind of the irony that she's now trapped in Tallahassee. Is she upset about this? Again, I can't comment on what she said or hasn't said, but I can say um, she's clearly not happy about being in a detention facility. Um, uh, I, I don't I don't think uh, that matters whether she's in Tallahassee or someplace else, um, but she's clearly not happy about being in a detention facility. Um, but I, I obviously can't talk any more about what she said or not said. Armand Fenn's part of STS Nation. Uh, do you know, this obviously came up and is a $64,000 question, why Wendy Adelson was at Trescott on the day of the murder? Uh, do you happen to know the answer to that? Also, did it hurt your case with Charlie? Because it obviously at least invokes uh, in some people. Thank heavens for, the, for his audience. Great question. Great question minds uh, a sense of guilt that she was going to check on things yeah I, I i don't i don't know whether it hurt the case it should help the case because if you look at the timing it's it's clear that um that katie had already learned um that the deed had been done well before wendy gets there um why she was there i guess you know she's testified generally why she was there which is the liquor store that she goes to is is in that vicinity. She drives through that way. And Jeff Lacoste, something that didn't come out at the trial that's come out in depositions and probably would come out at the next trial if this came up, is Jeff Lacoste has testified that they would drive down that route all the time, that Wendy has a bad sense of direction, that she would kind of use. that. That's interesting. That is a good, that, so. Should she ever be prosecuted? That was the question I asked. Did anyone else say she had a bad sense of direction? But let's just stop right here and and, and um, hold on one second. Let me try to pull up while I can. Is it the society page who has such a good video on this? Yes. Society page and Jibber's channel, G I, wait, sorry, G H I B E R C Z, Jibber's. So funny. I think that's a kind of a wink and a nod to when Wendy was asked how she spelled Jibber's and she said, I don't know. And Georgia Kappelman said, oh, Excuse me. Didn't you have Dan Markell's number programmed into your phone under gibbers? It's a great little moment in the first trial of Katie McBanawa and Sigfredo Garcia. So let me see if I can find that video and we can watch it together just to, just so we bring a little reality and, just to read Sally A's comment, Rashi is blaming the YouTube podcast community and the media and the jurors, just like Charlie did. Absolutely right. With tunnel vision for not winning the case. So meaning we have this, we are not opening our minds to the idea that Charlie Adelson could be really, could really be a victim of a distortion, uh, extortion, distortion. That's little Freudian slip there <laughs> is distortion. Shame on you, Roberta. How could you stand in the way of justice? <laughs> Thanks, Sally. A. Thanks. Yeah, it's so true. It's so something that that uh, it's, it's like, I, I, it's very much like these kind of, very quick things to Klein he's representing at the time, but he's saying he's very fond of Donna. I don't even think that that is his duty to say that Donna is loving. I mean, very rarely do you see a defense attorney call an accused, their accused murderer client loving. I mean, it's really over the top. I don't know how much we've been going. Oh, wow. Wow. Time flies, right? And we've gotten through so little of this, but. Where she used to live as a guiding post as to where she was going and that they would drive that on that road a lot of times out of the way to get to places. Um, but I don't know personally, um, other than what she testified to in trial, 
why she was on that road. Uh, did it hurt Charlie at trial? I'm not sure. Um, I've always seen it as a good fact. Um, if you look at it um, in a neutral perspective, um, at least a good fact for Wendy. Um, but um, I'm not sure that it was either a good or a bad fact for Charlie. Uh, I, I will respectfully tell you after. Well, Charlie thinks it's a terrible fact. He thinks it's a terrible fact, Rashbaum. He thinks that it's one of the things that convicted him. Sanyo says, did you hear Dan says he was not surprised the jury came back fast? I did not hear him say that. He was telling the jury to look up specific page numbers and listen to the end of tapes. Yeah, that I know. They didn't do any of it. Yeah, because they had no one supported Charlie's story. It was just Charlie's story. That's what they had as a defense. Charlie's story, no, not his. His parents weren't going to lie for him. His sister wasn't supposed to know anything about this extortion. And even June wasn't going to lie for him. So in my opinion, that's my opinion of it. And I think it's pretty much a fact now that the jury convicted him. But you heard in the beginning of this, Sanyo, that he said that his defense worked. You know, I just hope that what I, I would think, what even if you're an STS fan, what you should be asking yourself and asking Joel is what is your relationship with Daniel Rashbaum? Was he one of your three sources? You said you had three sources. Or did you just have one really, really good source that Donna was arrested in the airport? And does Daniel Rashbaum have to return that light ring? That's what I want to know. <laughs> if you're looking at a map, that is not bad with directions. That's a uh, horrible, awful, or uh, you know, just utterly lost because it's hard to end up there. Um, does the Donna know? I'll say, the only thing I'll say, Joel, is have, having been a person who used to prosecute murder for hires. Uh, two things about murder for hires is usually when you do a murder for hire, you do it because you don't want to be anywhere near the murder. So most people who do murder for hires, they don't then go down the road to if, if, if they were going to do that, they do the murder for hire themselves. Right. It's not consistent with a murder for hire. Um, but I, again, I don't know why she was there. I know where she lives. I know where she was going. I know there was a more direct route. I can see that. Um, but I, I, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me that she would go down the route to check on something that had she been part of, she would have already known about. I mean, they don't, you know, it makes it, it does make sense if it was a murder for hire and she wanted to see if the job was done. But you, you're a defense attorney. We can argue that point back and forth. But uh, Sandy Gonzalez. Oh, come on. He doesn't. He's opening his mouth like a Muppet, like he wants to. Now he wants to defend Wendy. So is he, is he, wait, is he hoping he gets a trifecta? He gets to represent Charlie, Donna, and Wendy? I mean, there, you know, it's his duty to defend. It's not his duty, in my opinion, to put out untruths. That No one's asking him to do that. And that's where, where my issue with him. No one, and so, I'm sorry. I just pulled up your, I'm sorry, whoever just left that comment. Um, here, I think it's here. Hoptic Frequency says, I think Rash going to get called out as overly emotional involved with STS interview. Well, he went on there to do PR for Donna. Did he achieve it? I don't know. Everyone, I, I don't know if my audience is the target audience for this. Uh, um, this is after we have info that he gave advice on fleeing, but who knows if the prosecutor would even pursue it if true. Yeah. So, even if so, not only did he give her advice, what Donna says is that he was letting her know that the grand jury was going to meet that Wednesday. They bought a ticket right after Charlie's conviction. 
for the 13th, the night of the 13th. So the grand jury would have been, so that was a Monday. The grand jury was supposed to be held on a Wednesday, the 15th, November 15th. So he tipped Don off that that was coming down. And even if he got reported to some bar for, for unethical practices, it's very hard. Those bars are made up of other lawyers. You have to do something really black and white, provable. And I don't think Donna's phone was tapped at that. <laughs> and then we know it tapped at that time. There's no way he's going to probably deny it. And Donna would probably, Donna, Donna, I, I would lie for you, Rashi. I would, I would perjure myself for you, Rashi. You know, so it's just like, try to prove it. And even if it was proven, what is that? A slap on the wrist? I don't think so. I think it's gross. I think it's unethical. I think him coming out on here and saying that, saying that they didn't, that they cooperated and, and maligning basically putting down the Tallahassee police department and saying they're basically incompetent is revolting, morally repellent, but um, I, I'm not, you know, he already doesn't like, you know, I'm already, you know, it's like, he's not going to come on this podcast. He's not going to have any discussions with me. It's not, you know, I'm not, my opinion doesn't really matter so much in that. I'm just giving you my opinion. Very honest, straight shooting from the hip. Do you know how Charlie um, feels about, are you, are you speaking with Charlie often? First of all, I don't speak with uh, Charlie at all. I'm not his, I'm not his lawyer his right now. Okay. Uh, so do you have any idea, um, you know, as the trial was winding up or during it, uh, his feelings toward Katie? This is a question from Sandy Gonzalez. No, I, I don't. Hmm. I don't. I don't know what his feelings were after. I know that he knew she was a, that he thought she was a liar during. But I, I don't know more than that. Does Donna Adelson know you're doing this interview right now? And, and how does she feel about <laughs> it? Uh, again, I, I can't tell you uh, what we've discussed and what we haven't discussed, but I think. Uh, you can rest assured that um, I, I. He wouldn't be. He wouldn't be out here if Donna didn't approve. He's doing PR for Donna. You know, when I was young, I was so dumb when I first started watching true crime. I used to think that these lawyers believed everything that they said. So, uh, I think there's still a bunch of true crime people that think that that Rashbaum doesn't know that these people are guilty. Do you know what I mean? I keep my clients updated. <laughs> I'll take that as a yes. By the way, that wasn't my question. It was from a Patreon member. I, I want to say KCL. So uh, that was a kind of a funny question. Uh, were you surprised, uh, Jerry Michael here, at how quickly the jurors came to a verdict uh, in your case with Charlie? Me, not really. I wasn't that surprised um, personally. But... Uh, it's irrelevant, but I wasn't that surprised. Hmm. Um, Alex Mora. Oh, there, there it is. See, I haven't seen this before, guys. That's probably why I'm stopping it every two minutes. Let me know if it's too much. Uh, C-Star asks what, uh, I think he's testing the response for trial. Did someone just ask Beverly? This is, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think what, I'll tell you what I think he's doing. Beverly, Hayes Houston says, why go on tour for your client prior to trial? What he's trying to do is trying to change public opinion, get public, uh, change public opinion to be more favorable to Donna to make, and that will make a more favorable atmosphere, i.e. jury pool, et cetera, in Tallahassee. And it will also protect Wendy a bit. So we like to think that our courts work in a vacuum. Unfortunately, they don't. And public opinion, this kind of PR before a trial, can you know can be more favorable. We can get you a more favorable jury. 
So you're not picking people think that they're picking people who've like never heard of Donna Donna Adelson or don't know of the case. No, they're looking for people. Watch the videos up on Murder by Maestro's channel of the voir dire, meaning the jury selection. And they're not picking people who don't know anything about the case. They're picking people who don't have a strong opinion about guilt or innocence. So yeah, very. And it's also, he's also advertising himself. And I also think that Rashbaum wants to be one of these, like a Garago, uh, Mark Garagos, a, a famous defense attorney, like a, oh, I'm practically turning a little green talking about it, but like an Alan Dershowitz, very smart man, but in my opinion, totally morally vacant. He's the one who worked out a deal for Epstein. He's the one who's been accused. And of course, they both settled that in the most hard to believe manner. She said she was mistaken. And he said he was mistaken for accusing her of being a liar. So, so they both agreed to call it a draw. They both had to walk back their accusations. And they left it because Dershowitz is such a brilliant defense attorney and he's so aggressive he got david boys thrown off that case meaning the his alleged victim's lawyer by calling him up and then saying oh you've already you know <clears throat> you're already you've already and talking to him and saying oh you've already talked to me and you've already been about i don't know about the case or whatever and got him thrown off it's it's really dirty. He plays dirty, in my opinion. Go to my episode, Strange Attractors, about Alan Dershowitz, how he used a priest in the Klaus von Bülow retrial, how he used a, a priest who later was accused by multiple men of being victimized by him. And he died of AIDS, that priest. He committed, and that priest committed perjury for the Pla Klaus von Bülow case. So I did a sworn affidavit that was determined to be perjury in that case. Check that out. You won't find that information. It's not readily available, but very interesting. So th this is what I'm talking about. These kind of lawyers that are really comfortable kind of in this I would call it working outside the confines of the law. That's my opinion, my view of it. Chris, I believe his, his real first name is Robert, if I'm right about that. He is a Tallahassee-based attorney. Did you hire him? Did Donna hire him? And why hire him? So Donna hired him. Um, I'm not the client. Uh, but he's a terrific lawyer. Um, uh, I felt like he was someone that I could work real well with. Um uh, and, uh, and I think, you know, Donna liked him obviously. Um, and, uh, I'm excited to work with him. Uh, where'd it go there? Ann Arbor, Michigan in the house. And I'm trying to catch up to the, uh, where'd it go? They have a horrible DA in Ann Arbor. So there's a, that's a case that there's a DA in Ann Arbor is one of these former defense attorneys. He let out a guy who was caught on tape doing the crime. Caught on tape. His own father ID'd him. And they let him out. The Probably the poor people of Ann Arbor can now have to pay for his multi-million dollar judgment when he sues civilly for his quote-unquote wrongful conviction. They found uh, they found the clothes that he did the crime with in his home. They found, I believe they found the weapon was a burglary case. Oh my law. Anyway, so how, how Donna, Donna, Donna picked this lawyer Morris. She took, I took around Donna's, as Donna's banana bread. Rashi took around my banana bread to lawyers and the ones that, that loved my banana bread. That's how we chose. That's how it worked, guys. The ones that liked the fancy lady's banana bread and Morris liked it the most. There's a question a lot of people must ask you. Do you really believe Charlie's story, Charlie Adelson's story? 
again, I can't talk about Charlie's case, right? Um, out of respect to his current lawyer, uh, and out of respect to to him as a as a prior client. So I have to punt on that one. I have to ask you about some conflicts here. Um, you were Donna Adelson and I believe Harvey's attorney first. Uh, Charlie was with David Oscar Marcus, a pretty well known criminal defense attorney. Um, do you fear some sort of conflict? And did did Charlie and or Donna have to sign a waiver in order for you to represent? her now and did you ever stop representing her so uh let me kind of take things in turn if you don't mind that was a, that was a so, lot of questions <laughs> yeah so uh i did originally represent harvey and donna in a joint representation for years when charlie was arrested that representation changed um and and there was a conflict uh and it was a waivable conflict that was waived by all parties okay at that point in time, I represented Charlie Adelson and did not represent Donna or Harvey Adelson. Donna and Harvey Adelson at that point in time got their own got their own lawyer. OK, now you asked whether there's a conflict now. And the answer is yes, there is a conflict. It is a waivable conflict. So with ethics, lawyers and waivers by all the relevant parties, that conflict has been waived. And as a result, I now no longer represent Charlie Adelson or Harvey Adelson, but only represent Donna Adelson. So just. He only has eyes for Donna. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I'm going to probably put, draw this to a close pretty soon because otherwise we'll be. Um, listening to this all night, but who knows what soon is. I'm kind of interested to see where this goes a little bit. I'll try not to keep stopping it every two minutes. But there's that's a guess that DA from forgetting his name now. You could probably look it up. I'll try to look it up. But that's a there's another example of someone I wanted to talk to him about that case when he let out that guy and proclaimed the guy was caught on tape, proclaimed innocence all over the in internet. And his secretary said, yes, absolutely. We were working out dates. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> he was unavailable ever. He He's going to be unavailable until eternity. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Miss Glass. The DA is now unavailable forever. <laughs> so it's just anytime... I had a great client, uh, a great client, a great, I've listened to this too much, great guest, Tori Magoo, who got to the top of Scientology. And she talked about advice her father gave her. And he said, you know, anyone, you can disagree, you can have differences of opinion with people, but anybody who won't come to the table and sit down and talk it out with you is a bully. And that's what very much what I found about people on who who do the bidding of the wrongful conviction movement. And I would even put lawyers connected to it, like Daniel Rashbaum via Dubin in this category. They're never going to sit down with someone like me. They're only going to sit down with friendly interviewers. If I'm wrong, I will say I'm wrong. Daniel Rashbaum, if you want to come on and ask answer tough questions, I would say that the chances are almost never of that happening, but maybe I'm wrong. But you know Don is not going to want him to come on the show like this. He's already said th that I'm the problem. I'm the problem. So, yeah, I would call them bullies. And they they only want to talk to friendly, friendly interviewers. And most of the, most of the mainstream press doesn't do their research doesn't have the time to do the real research you need to ask the important questions in these cases. And um, we'll give them these softball interviews. Just to be clear, when you say, were you fearful that there was a conflict? There is a conflict. It just happens to be a waivable conflict that has been waived by everyone. So Harvey, Donna, Charlie all had to say, sign something agreeing to allow you to be Donna's attorney solely. Correct. And they, they had to do so. The most prudent way to do it is with an independent counsel advising them, 
so that I'm not part of that decision making process. OK, but there is a conflict. It just happens to be a waivable conflict. Uh, Sh uh, Sharon McCarthy, does Dan, a part of SCS Nation here, does Dan think Charlie being so well prepared on the stand actually harmed his case? Uh, it sounds paradoxical, counterintuitive, but Charlie had an answer for everything and he knew dates going way back. And uh, he obviously studied the case, knew the case, knew the case file uh, in retrospect, Dan Rashbaum. Um, was that problematic, do you think, for the jury, that he was too smooth? It's a hard question to answer, um, and I can, I, I can only do it on the uh, exteriors because, again, uh, I can't get into Charlie's case. But I can say generally it's a, it's a hard line um, afterward um, of, of, look, you have to prepare your clients, and you want them to be overprepared. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, they need to be natural. Um, and so, uh, you know, again, was he overprepared? I don't think so. Um, I think, I think, um, I, I think it's, it, preparation's important, especially when you're, when you're fighting for your life. Um, but again, um, and look, I prepare all my clients to testify whether they're going to testify or not. Um, but the reality is I, 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 I have a hard time answering that question when I can't get into the details of Charlie's case. And uh, Dan did make that known. He can't get into the details because it is now under appeal. Why doesn't he just say I was too close? I was too close to see it the way the jury saw it. I saw it as great. That I, I think that's a better answer. Look at bossy Texas chick. Getting two of her questions in. Way to go, lady. She's the the audience is really doing the heavy lifting in this interview, huh? And yes, whoever said the Innocence Project was started was basically blossomed at O.J. Simpson's case when Barry Schecht, who along with Peter Newfeld started the Innocence Project. Barry Schecht basically bamboozled the jury about what what D DNA is all about. They were totally confused because it was just the birth of DNA. Was there a reason they had to file that appeal late in the evening on December 31st, Dan Rashbaum? Do you know? I was wondering that. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know when the deadline was. Um, so uh, I don't know if the deadline was January 1 or whether. I have no idea is a short mm -hmm. answer, but uh, he's got a very good appellate lawyer. By the way, I saw you without a beard in a photo. You look bar mitzvah age without the beard. So uh, you should probably keep the beard. Um, I no, used to the, be the beard goes in and out. It's just I'm too lazy to shave every day. Uh, uh, so the beard goes in and out. Most of my friends uh, tease me about the beard now. So. Uh, bossy Texas, Texas chicken. These are great questions. Again, best guess, better community. Did you feel bad? Everyone, everyone talked about this moment, Dan, uh, when you told Charlie enough. Uh, this was... Was Charlie a difficult, was Charlie, I guess you can't answer that. He can't say that he's a challenging client, even if he was. But I, I don't know. I, I don't know about, did he feel badly? I mean, what's he going to say? No, of course he's going to say no. I forget exactly where in the trial, but it was audible. Charlie was kind of badgering you and you said enough. Um, and everyone picked up on that. What, what what was going on behind the scenes there, if you can tell us? No, I mean, I can't tell you what was going on behind the scenes, but I didn't feel bad about it. It actually had nothing to do with the trial. I can tell you that much. And it had actually nothing to do with the case. I can tell you that much. I can also say that uh, Charlie Adelson and I got along very well um, before the case, during the case, and to the extent that I had communications with him after the case, we always got along very well. Obviously, in trial, there's a lot of things going on. And, um, you know, there's a lot of pressures uh, on the lawyer and on the client. Uh, and you're trying to listen to many things at the same time. And so uh, I actually remember the moment. It was not a moment for us. I think it was a YouTube moment that probably got blown out of proportion, kind of like I think at one point they took a note of Kate's. I don't remember what it was. She was talking about the New York Yankees and George Steinbrenner. And they start saying that uh, Kate was saying something derogatory about the judge or about Charlie or about something. It was about it was about the Yankees who look, we're Cleveland Indians fans. So uh, or, sorry, Guardians fans. So that's what was being discussed. So, um, again, uh, that's an example of kind of things being taken out of context. Um, my relationship with Charlie was always good.
Uh, I was going to actually guess it was. So for whoever was asking where they can find this interview, the link is in the description of this episode. And the, I don't know what Joel's last name is. Probably someone else knows. I'm not that much of a super fan of STS to tell you, but it's Joel's, the interviewer's name. I was mad that you forgot his McDonald's uh, double cheeseburger, but I was close because it was uh, about the Yankees. Who knew? Um, Laszlo Toth the third. In case management, you tell the court that be, quote unquote, be forewarned, my case may take a week. You only call two witnesses. Uh, can you tell us why or what happened? There were only going to be uh, two witnesses called. Um, but look, from my perspective, we didn't want the state to know that we were going to call Charlie Adelson. And from my perspective, I didn't want the judge. Uh, I didn't want to surprise the judge. And his testimony could have gone on for longer. It didn't. Um, so you're kind of as a defense lawyer in a in a weird in a weird position in that. Wasn't he up there for a long time, Charlie? I thought it was like. He's right. It could have gone longer, but it was it felt like forever. I thought it was like three days of testimony or something. The reason why he only had two witnesses because his story is completely untrue. <laughs> That's why nobody, and that should be a big red flag to everyone that it's made up. No one, no one could verify Charlie's story. You have to, I didn't tell the judge we have thousands of witnesses. I just said our case could take a week. By the way, it took, I think, two or three days. Um, so, um, uh, there were no surprises there. The only other possible witnesses we were going to call, frankly, um, was potentially, um, Donna Adelson. How tough an adversary you see here, Ta uh, Tasha Awesome, uh, Georgia, how tough an adversary is Georgia Kappelman? She's a terrific lawyer and a terrific human being. Um, uh, I have a lot of respect for her. Um, I hope she has respect for me too. I think she does. Um. Uh, mm, hmm. So then he's talking himself up. He uses that as a bridge to talk himself up. So it's interesting. It's like, you know, we've had both of these guys talk themselves up. We've had Joel say how much integrity he has or as a journalist and all this stuff. And, and then now we have Rashi doing the same kind of thing. I think she has a lot of respect for for me too meaning if you're on the if you're on the side the pro prosecution side you should like me because georgia likes me because he knows that we all love georgia and this is a good time to let everybody know <laughs> little taking a page from the sts playbook <laughs> that i have i mean i don't it's there's no money and it's just a fun thing for me to to talk to other people who love Georgia Kappelman. I have the Georgia Kappelman Appreciation Society <laughs> uh, group on Facebook. If anybody wants to join to talk about how talk about the case and talk about Georgia and Dugan and all the the great prosecution team, but we particularly love Georgia. She's. So feeling, she brings just a lot of feeling, a lot of emotion into the courtroom. You don't often see with prosecutors, a lot of creativity. I'm crazy about her. I'm just terrific. Queen Georgia, Queen Georgia. Terrific lawyer. And so is, so is Sarah Dugan. So, um, and so are, so are their team of investigators. They're, they're very, very good lawyers. All right, so let's pivot over here to Donna's arrest. It's a video that the world has now seen. It's going to be on Dateline. Uh, shout out to Law & Crime for getting it first. And I'm going to play a little snippet, and then we'll talk about it uh, real quick. All right, how are you? You have an ID? All right, how are you? You have an ID? You have an ID? Yeah, I'm going to arrest uh dan you can see her pulling uh the phone away there uh what struck me about this um she never asks 
um, what murder. Uh, you're probably going to tell me because the uh, FBI agent Pat Van Sanford tells her she's being charged with the murder of Dan Markell. But what's also glaringly omitted from here is her saying, I didn't do this. I'm innocent. How come she doesn't say that? Uh, again, I can't speak about what she has told me or what she hasn't told me. I would say stay tuned for trial for that. Um, I don't think it's any surprise that she would know what murder she was being charged for. I think uh, just days earlier. Uh, I tipped her off that the grand jury was meeting. This is interesting. This is interesting. This is not the answer I expected here. This may be the longest live stream in the history of the world. I hope you guys aren't bored. Um, I'll try to not stop at it, but I'm really interested that he answered it this way. So it sounds like they're gearing up for some surprise defense, a la Charlie. And it may be like totally separate, like in a bizarro world, meaning not congruent with Charlie's defense. So some other kind of wacko theory, because we know that Daniel Rashbaum isn't 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 above putting out a, a wacky theory and surprise on surprise. So why didn't she say she was innocent? Why didn't she? You know, I I thought he would have said, "You never know what you're going to do when you're arrested." We like to think we'd say one thing, you know, something like that, some kind of nonsense like that but no very interesting answer here uh you know uh, her, her son was convicted of a murder in which she showed pictures of her and her husband as co-conspirators for her. so i don't think there is anything to, to really say about that I, I don't think that that's very surprising to me it's a short clip i'm going to play it again so i just want to get you Um, well, I'm going to get into this a little bit more, but, uh, Dan, uh, the obvious question is if, uh, they are innocent, she's innocent. Um, she's, she's grabbing onto that phone with, with, uh, white clutched fingers. Why not just give it over? I guess the proof of the pudding will be if there's anything on that phone, right? What I can tell you is there's nothing on that phone. And so if there's nothing on that phone. Do you know that? I mean, has the has the forensics evidence come back? The digital front? Can you say that 100 percent that there's nothing the short on answer, any of those the, sh the short answer for me is I've reviewed the phone and I don't see anything incriminating on the phone. Not to Don Adelson. Well, of course he's going to say that. Just know that this is PR for Donna Adelson, for everybody listening who may be like I was as a young, <laughs> as a young true crime watcher who believed everything out of his mouth, out of these defense attorneys mouth. He, of course, he's going to say this. This is a PR exercise to hype up the Donna Adelson is innocent. I don't know what you call it narrative narrative is there so just of course if if there was a text on there that said i feel badly for murdering you know i murdered dan markell and i'm glad he's dead or something you know or something really incriminating because it, you know that rash is going to see an alternate way out of everything on that phone so this kind of, the way he's acting makes me think that there's something that the prosecution is going to go with on the phone. And it's something that he sees an alternative excuse for. This is just, I may be wrong. There may be nothing. There may be other evidence. There's, we know that there's enough evidence to convict just on what they have. They have alone her, her saying <clears throat> that it involves the two of us. After the bump, the emails, the whole, the whole, um, the whole, everything else that we know that's public. Telling June uh, that Dan Markell is haunting her from the grave. 
they're all things very incriminating. So, so if there's nothing incriminating on the phone, then maybe that's someone's reaction, right? Again, uh, a video doesn't always tell the truth. Although it happened, no, I'm not suggesting someone doctored the video. It doesn't always tell the whole story, right? And so the bottom line is, if there's something on the phone that's incriminating, then you can read into why she might have grabbed the phone the way she did, okay? But if so, what you what you didn't see on the video? So when the video turned to the arresting officer's stomach, what you didn't see that was the moment. Just like how Charlie whispered to his dad about the extortion only when you couldn't hear on video. <laughs> That's the time that Donna said, what is this all about? I did not kill Dan Markell. This is an outrage. I'm shocked. That It just doesn't tell the whole story, guys. <laughs> That's the moment. And when it looked like she was drinking sips of water and asking about her warrant, what you didn't see is the moment right when she hands it back and she says, by the way, thanks for the water. I did not kill Dan Mark out. You didn't see those moments, guys. <laughs> oh, funny. There's something, if there's nothing on the phone, then maybe it's something else. Uh, here's another question. Um, you know, this to me, and I'm not an attorney, reeks of consciousness of guilt. Uh, how problematic is it that they were on a flight to Dubai to try to get to Vietnam on a one-way ticket, Dan Rashbaum? I mean, it doesn't reek of consciousness of guilt because her son had just I mean, been... who, But who travels with a, a one-way ticket to a foreign land? No one that I know. Her son just been wrongfully convicted. Who... Sorry, not to be like, if everybody, not to talk myself up like these two, but who said this? Who predicted that this was going to be the rap? Who said it? I did. I said it. I called it. I said, she saw that her son was wrongfully convicted and she knows the horrors of the wrongful conviction. How many wrongful convictions there are in America. She had to just get on that plane, guys. Let's hear it. Let's hear it, Rashi. No, it does that. Well, there's various reasons to travel one-way tickets, right? I, I've done it before myself. Now, having said that, uh, consciousness of guilt is when you know you're guilty of something and you are fleeing because of it, okay? In this case, Donna Adelson has been a suspect in this case since 2016. She didn't go anywhere. Now, what had happened a week previously is her son had been convicted of a crime that she didn't believe he did. And he had been convicted of that crime rather quickly. And so as a result of that, this 73-year-old woman decided, I need to get away. And I need to clear my mind. And I need to go somewhere with my husband. Right? And so the reality is, is it a good fact for her? No, it's not a good fact for her. I wish she had stayed put. Right? She probably would still not be charged. But the reality is, it doesn't show consciousness of guilt. Uh, I'm going to beg to differ because uh, I don't know anyone that I know of that has traveled halfway around the world with a one-way ticket that plans on coming back unless you're backpacking through Europe as a kid. But we'll, we'll circle back to that. Um, so now you're obviously Donna's lawyer because uh, all these waivers that we talked about previously. Um, can you tell us where you are where you are in this case? There's a hearing Monday. Are you going to request a speedy trial? Well, uh, we're still figuring things out. Again, uh, I'm not her only lawyer. Uh, and while uh, media has reported that I'm a lead lawyer, that I have local counsel, that's just not the case. Uh, Alex and I are co-counsel on the case. Uh, while I know the case, it's uh, pretty well. It's a different case than Charlie's. Um, and Alex obviously has to, uh, has to get up to speed. So um, while we hope the trial will happen sooner rather than later. She was <laughs> bossy. Texas chick is like the co-interviewer. <laughs> Shout out to you, bossy. Oh, <laughs> she's like the co-host on this. It's her third question. Maybe more. I may have missed one. Holy cow. Will Donna cop a plea? She's doing like the heavy lifting for this channel. Holy cow. 
uh just really funny just really quickly helmet <laughs> helmet Flyker says she was going to vietnam to find a nice tunnel to move into Oh, oh, he's just getting absolute roast of rash bam on this channel. Isabel Rivera says a great defense is the children farted on their grandparents and they took a drive to the airport. I mean, just like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I just can't believe you. Where? Oh, man. Bossy Texas chick. Why aren't you in this chat? She's probably tired out from doing all the heavy lifting, asking the tough questions. She's picking up the slack for Joel here, man. Uh, we're, we're, we're talking about. If you about don't subscribe to her channel, there is, you know, I don't, I, I go to that channel to just, it's just like, a, you know, she's, she asks so many questions of herself. And we'll give multiple answers, move things, you know, multiple ways. And it's a fun exercise for me to listen to her. But boy, is she doing the heavy lifting here. Uh, what we're going to be requesting on Monday. Uh, bossy Texas chick again. Uh, I'm going to try to mix up. I didn't I didn't see it was her again. But uh, is there any intention, can you tell us, to try to um, work out some plea agreement? Are you there yet? No. Why would she plead to something she didn't do? So that's that's a definitive no you plan to go she and you plan to go to trial yes and uh so what just tell us what should we expect uh the hearing is monday morning at 10 30 you've obviously got to fly up or drive to tallahassee what what should we expect? okay i seriously i know i really think sanyo you have hit on a better my, this might be a better defense than rash baum has roberta those special bananas for donna's banana breads are in vietnam she was going for ingredients, guys. Thank you, Sanyo. And you charged nothing for that. That was just free legal advice you gave. That's why they were in there picking clothes. Yeah, uh, that's why they were in there. That's that's like that's what she was picking at her clothes for. That, right, right. She was looking for special ingredients for banana bread. Come on, guys. Looks like they are are wrapping this up. So that's what it looks like to me. It looks like a short interview. Uh, and if you are Daniel Rashbaum, you would want to keep it fairly short. Back at this hearing on uh, on Monday. Uh, I'm not really sure. I mean, I think it'll be pretty short. Uh, it'll be some discussion, I'm sure, about discovery. Uh, there may be some uh, discussion about, uh, about uh, scheduling. Uh, and there could be discussion about the waivers, uh, although I, I'm not sure that that would happen at this at this hearing. Um, but it will deal with whatever the judge wants us to deal with. What's your ideal time frame for a trial date? If you could start this trial, if you had your druthers and if Donna, more importantly, had her druthers, um, when would you start this? Uh, when we're ready. But uh, but I'm not I'm not I'm, I'm not sure but as to a particular date. But give me a time. We're talking April or are we talking, uh, you know, November of uh, 2024? We don't know. But obviously, as soon as we can be ready, we'd like to go to trial. I mean, I've got to assume from what you're telling me, Donna is not uh, too pleased being behind bars. Does she want to go to trial? Does she want to get out from behind those bars? Of course, she wants to get out from the detention center. But we'll we'll go to trial when we're ready. That's the most important thing. See, now they're going to delay. That's what that sounds like to me. He he's he's telling Donna we we need more time. Morris is on the case now. He needs to get caught up. We want to put on a good defense. It doesn't matter. She's going to be convicted quickly anyway. It doesn't really matter. I think I would be. You know, it's a fool's game to predict a jury, but. I can't see her getting off, but you never know. You know, amazing things happen. Casey Anthony, O.J. Simpson, anyone? By the way, the Innocence Project has started representing, oh, gosh, I can see his uh, face <laughs> in um, uh, the one who killed his wife on a boat around Christmas. Help me out here. I might forget. I'm so tired forgetting this. 
Open waters. Yeah. Um, I'll just wait till you guys catch up to me. Debbie Gibby, you really, Scott Peterson, thank you. Yeah, they just started representing him. So they say that they only represent DNA cases, but they, there's a lot of non DNA case or some DNA, not, I wouldn't say a lot, some DNA cases that they'll, that they will put their name behind, you know, put their money behind. And they're, they're so well moneyed and they always represent themselves like they're the little, the little guy up against the man when they have, you know, 50 million times the money the process, the state has, or. Um, can you tell us her sort of her day to day in jail? What's her morning like or afternoon like or evening like? Do you have uh, a sense of that? Truthfully, I don't know. Um, and it's changed, obviously, because she just got moved recently to general population. Um, so um, but I, I don't know what her day to day is like. Uh, love my Sully Blue. How hard is it? I can answer that. I get up. I start complaining. And then I do a little bit. I do a little bit of drawing. I draw Rashbaum and myself and some hearts connecting us. And then I get. Then lunch comes. And then I complain. Then I hand back my fork, my spork, and then uh, and then I work on my case. And then I complain about my back pain. And then by that time, it's lights out. <laughs> It's a lot of complaining with Donna. I fill out my complaint forms one after the other. But isn't it funny that he started this out saying like that, <laughs> that, that she now can brush her teeth and all this. And they're like, well, what's her day to day like? And he's like, don't know. I have no idea. No clue. But I know she has a toothbrush, right? Ah, oh, law. All right. I hope this is winding down. I'm really tired. I'm getting really tired now to represent a client that the whole world thinks is guilty, which would be the case with both Donna and Charlie. Um, do you look at that as a challenge, um, a hurdle? How do you see it? Um, I, I think it, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't affect me personally. Let me say that. Um, it, it doesn't affect me personally, but, um, the only thing it affects is, uh, I'm a big believer in the system and, uh, in most trials, um, a jury comes to the trial and they know nothing about the case. Uh, and what they're presented with is the evidence of the case where the state or the government, in this case, the state has the burden of proof and has to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. In this case, the difficulty is that it's been tried in the media for seven plus years. Uh, and it's very hard for people to come to the case with that presumption of innocence. I think that was the most eye-opening um, piece to me um, in the last trial, the trial with Charlie. And it was depressing for me, to be honest with you, as someone who's worked on both sides and believes in the system and does this because the system is so important. We have the greatest system, I think, in the world. Um, but it's based on having a vigorous defense with a presumption of innocence where the state is not a dictatorship, where the state has to prove its evidence. F you, Rashi, for this answer. F you for maligning the jury. How dare you? The voir dire, meaning the jury selection, is public. Anybody can view it. Look at the way it was done. If anything, it was unfair the other way with Josh Dubin haranguing and berating the jury pool telling them that they had to see innocence all the way to the jury room until everybody could discuss it, which I don't even know how that's even possible. If everyone comes in, not evaluate the evidence as it as you can. Don't make up your mind till you get into the jury room. That's very different than see innocence, have a firm opinion of innocence all the way into the jury room. That's what he told the jurors. You can look. It's public. Go to Murder by Maestro's channel. Check out the voir dire on there. So he's blaming his loss on the jury. And then appealing to people like me who love our legal system and saying that it was a perversion of our le legal system. This is highly manipulative. 
just plain untrue to everybody who ever. And I talked to Sonny Tanner, who sat through it. One of the few people who went to the trial sat through the voir dire. And her, she came out with a opposite opinion, a really didn't know anything about Josh Dubin or the movement that he came from, uh, not too much, and had an absolutely negative opinion about the way that they conducted themselves. So where do you think Charlie got this whole rap about how bad the jury was? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to spontaneously explode watching this. And it's beyond a reasonable doubt. And for me, it was depressing to see all the jurors, not the jurors we had, but all the potential jurors come in there already with an opinion, already with opinion based on not one piece of evidence, just based on the media, right? Just based on podcasts, just based on YouTubes, just based how dare you, Rashbaum, say that? How dare you when your own jury consultant, well-moneyed, well-funded with a whole, whole, a whole support cast came in to berate the jury and tell them that they had to have an opinion of innocence exactly. This is, if this is not the biggest Darvo tactic, deny, attack, reverse victim offender that I've ever seen. This is not the biggest example of projection that I've ever seen. How dare you? This is absolutely, it's not, it's more than bull BS. It is, it's offensive. And then, and then to, to try to say that you're being, that you care so much about the, the system and the system working properly. When if anyone perverted the system, it was your, side. How dare you? Based on guesses, sometimes being wrong. And so that was depressing to me. So when you say how hard is it to represent someone who everyone thinks is guilty, it's not any harder for me than it was prosecuting someone who everyone thinks is guilty. Um, in fact, some defense lawyers say it's a lot easier to represent someone that you think is guilty. The hardest person to represent is someone that you think is innocent. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, but what the public thinks is kind of irrelevant to me. Um, I do my job and I do it to the best of my ability. Uh, Dan, by the way, is undefeated as a uh, prosecutor. Brick K here uh, almost sounds like, a, you know, a, a question uh, in jest, but I have a, uh, something to follow up here with. How come Donna rolls her eyes so much? Uh, Dan Rashbaum. Uh, Charlie in his trial was was making a lot of head motions and talking to himself. And in her first Tallahassee court appearance, Donna was interrupting the judge to the point where Judge Everett had to tell her to pipe down. Do you need to rein your client in more? Obviously, that was Maricel Descalzo at that point. Uh, it appears Donna likes to control situations. Will you have to have a conversation with her um, about courtroom behavior? He can't answer that. He answers that I'll be shocked. But Sally A says, listen, Rashi, you don't go on YouTube after you blamed YouTube for losing your case with the jurors. Great point, Sally A. Thank you guys for watching this with me. I'd probably be really um, hitting the walls with my fists if I, if I, didn't have someone little support group to watch this with. I find it. I just find it offensive, this kind of stuff, this kind of bold face lying. Hit the like button before the stream ends, right? Yeah, definitely do. Um, hit the like button. Please subscribe to the channel. Share this episode. I'm going to take a quick break just to kind of cool down. I need a palate cleanse. This has been a lot of rash bound. Quite a lot. Let me see if I can. Can I play a video over this and keep my place? Let me see if I can actually do that. I've never tried to do this. Let's see if this works. If you are enjoying this episode of my true crime report, please hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and share this episode. Get access 
to exclusive podcasts and other bonus content by becoming a patron today. If you have a question or comment for me, shoot me a super chat and I'll do my best to answer it and read it on air. Thanks so much. Now back to the show. It's so true, Teresa. Rashbaum isn't going to come on here. And I don't think I'll ever be on STS, but that's okay. That's okay, guys. Um, yeah. So why I find it offensive? I, I find it really offensive to blame. I quit smoking and I need a cigarette right now, right? Yeah, it's really maddening to blame the jury when we know we watch the trial, we watch the voir dire. Everything was done by the letter except that voir dire on your side. I thought it was really, really borderline. Telling the jurors that they had to have absolute, be drumming Charlie Adelson's innocence instead of coming at it with a neutral position. So that if the state didn't approve their case, they were willing to willing to acquit Charles Adelson. Everyone took an oath that they, all the jurors took an oath that they would do that. And you lost. And it's your own ego. And it's that same ego that, that makes me think that Daniel Rashbaum wants to be one of these lawyers. Those are the lawyers that make the big bucks. And funny thing Lewin's always great for these quotes. I'm always quoting him. And of course, I'm talking about the came the cold cases. John Lewin said, I said, is there any difference in going up against some of these like high powered lawyers, high price lawyers, like, you know, like a Mark Garagos. Um, and he said, yeah, they're not as good. They spend way. I think he, what he meant was that they spend way too much time not on actually defending their client, on doing interviews and promoting themselves, you know, said they're, they're easy to beat. So listen up, Rashi. I, I don't know. I just noticed that when I edit him, it's very long. I ended up editing it out a lot more than I do with Georgia Kaplan. She's much a tighter lawyer her pacing is much better well look um again i can't talk about the conversations i've had or will have with her but what i can tell you is this uh obviously there is a uh there is a um particular protocol um and demeanor that one should have in a courtroom uh and um you know it's going to be important for her obviously um to 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 participate in that way Having said that, why she rolls her eyes, I couldn't tell you. People have gestures. I mean, I now that I have this beard, I'm constantly doing this and this and whatever else. And sniffing my fingers. Oh, has he heard from our channel that is sniffing? Has he watched this channel? Wouldn't that be funny if he has? He's heard about his finger sniffing. That would be funny. Maybe he's watched the Daniel Rashbaum. Do you know that that episode where the thumbnail is Donna? picks Daniel Rashbaum. Has he watched that episode? <laughs> oh, I would love it. I would love it if he had. I don't know. This is a pretty tiny channel. I can't imagine him watching it, but oh well. Yeah. Um, I'm surprised he answered that. I'm really surprised he even answered it, even in that opaque way. Shocked. He's like, yeah. So basically, yeah, he's going to have to have a conversation about her demeanor. But we saw how expressive Charles Adelson was in court. So they're very expressive defendants, and it's going to be fun. It makes it more fun for us. So the more he can't rein her in, the more fun it's going to be for us. But the way everybody said, oh, this trial, this is going to go to trial so quickly, I think that's pretty much the big news of this interview is it's as I predicted. They're going to delay, delay, delay. 
So it's not going to go to a speedy trial as much as Donna wants to it to, unfortunately. I'm ready for this thing to go on yesterday. Great. But I don't think it will. Else, you know, we all have our ticks, right? Um, but um, and and by the way, when you're on camera, everyone is analyzing every tick, right? Uh, so, um, but yes, there has to be a protocol. There's a proper, there's a proper way to act in a courtroom and that will be important for her. Uh, Dan Rashbaum, if Harvey. Okay, Carrie, I'm going to take your advice, Carrie. I'm going to start. I'm just going to wind it down here. Maybe five more minutes. And, um, then, I, then I think I'm going to call it close. Thank you. That's good advice. Thank you, Carrie. I appreciate that. I think you're right. So Carrie B says, Roberta, maybe do a part two on Saturday. By the end, he was <laughs> sorry. By the end, he was yelling at us and calling us a mob. I can't wait. So very much like the Adelson family themselves, like blames everybody else for his own. I can't say it was his failure. You could have J Johnny Cochran and a million other what you know, famous lawyers who get people off, guilty people off up there. I, I j just think that there's no job a defense attorney could do that could get Charles Adelson off. I know that they all think they're so clever and that they can, but you can't. The evidence was against Charlie Adelson. It was, it was very strong. Georgia Kappelman, the... The uh, queen herself is a very, very, had a very strong prosecution team led by the fantastic Georgia Kaplan. It wasn't going to happen. Donna, Wendy are innocent. Why weren't they in the gallery at Charlie's trial there to support him? I mean, this is their son, their brother. So um, Wendy couldn't be in the gallery, obviously, because she was a witness at the trial. Uh, and um, let me just think about this for a second. Uh, Donna and Harvey were not there, but it wasn't their choice. That's what I can tell you. Um, uh, it was not their choice. And and if anyone saw the gallery and all the people that were in the gallery, um, I think probably they would understand why. Um, but I can assure you that Donna and Harvey were very supportive of Charlie. Uh, but, you know, I mean, you've got to know what the optics of that is when none of your family members are at a murder trial for for your child. Right. I, I don't think the actually I know the optics weren't bad uh, because I've spoken to several uh, jurors um, and I actually asked that question because I was curious. That was one of the few questions I asked all of the jurors I spoke to, and that had no effect on any of them. It may have um, had an effect on your YouTube uh, commenta commenters, <laughs> but it didn't on the jurors. Now, are you uh, in any way afraid uh, by being here of contaminating a future uh, jury pool? No, um, no, not at all. Um, and, you know, Ms. Kappelman has gone on shows before as well. I'm not the only one. I think she was on. I don't remember if it was your show or someone else's, um, but she's been on shows. And uh, nothing I'm saying on here is any. So what he's saying, so to answer your question, so what he's saying is that it's the state's fault for demanding that should they come into the trial that they'll a a ask them questions. For asking, we're basically saying it's the state's fault for asking them to testify and it's the Markell's fault for showing up to the trial that they didn't want to be in the room with the Markells and that they didn't want to answer questions and they wanted to maintain their their they wanted to take the fifth the fifth so they said that would should they be called up they would have taken the fifth and i guess he's blaming everybody for saying for for public opinion for thinking that his innocent clients are guilty and they didn't want to be in that atmosphere so again it's everyone else's fault anything that would uh, contaminate a jury pool any and more than they're the already contaminated, right? <laughs> you have shows every day about this case, right? And law enforcement and people who have no idea anything about the case pontificating about the case. 
So, no, I'm, I'm not fearful of that at all. And speaking of Georgia Kappelman, uh, Steve Cohen did reach out to her. Uh, we wanted to obviously get her uh, take. She is uh, forbidden. She works for the state. A uh, very nice email she wrote back, and she plans on coming on STS, but she cannot come on until the entire case is resolved, and we simply don't know where that will be. But she has been on before. Uh, I'm going to pull up. This is an actual email uh, from Donna to Wendy. I'm going to read it out loud uh, here. Uh, she, Donna says, you have a job to Wendy to get done in a very short time frame to accomplish it. If you dressed your kids up in Hitler youth uniforms and brought them down here, I could care less if it was an act of defiance. And I would show gibbers derogatory term for Dan that he's not in control. All caps. If your children are baptized, it doesn't make them Christian. Ben and Lincoln aren't really pirates because they dress up like Jake the pirate. It's an act. You got into this mess with gibbers by being so compliant and non-confrontational with him. Um, I don't have the exact date in front of me. Now I got to say, Dan, uh, we are, email. we are both Jewish boys. Uh, this is not a hateful email, Dan, in my opinion, my mother's a survivor. This is demented. This is not a, 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 a rational, normal mom. She had a lot of crazy ideas. You're going to see him. Anybody remember his opening? I think this is a good place to end it. Oh, okay. Hold on one second. I'm getting some. Okay, thank you. Ta uh, time to close it. Um, close it down. I think this is a good place to end. Donna had a lot of crazy ideas. You're gonna, you're gonna hear them. I think this is a really good place to end it on a cliffhanger. The thank you STS for doing the interview, giving us so much fodder. But I think it does open up more questions than answers about. And I don't think we're ever going to get a straight answer as to what the relationship is between STS and Dan Rashbaum is. Um, I was going to read a victim impact letter, but I'll just try to find a short one because I'll save that one for, I think everybody's tired tonight. And I just wanted to pick a little bit of a shorter one. These are all, look at how many people love Dan Markell. Look at this. So I'm scrolling through. This is the one I picked last night from the rabbi. Oh, okay. Oh, you can't see. I'm not sharing my screen. I do that all the time talking to Werner by Maestro. He's like, oh, you're not sharing your screen. We talk all the time on Zoom. <laughs> ah, you must be out there laughing. Hold on. Let me. I don't know if I found a short one that I haven't read. Let me see. Let me go to the beginning and then I'll share it in one second. Let me find one that's a little bit. These are all so long and I'm so, so tired. So um, I'll pick this one. Um, I think I've read this one, but I think it's just a good reminder, good place to end for the night. Um So this is from the Sigfredo Garcia McBanawa trial. Dan, Mar Dan Markell and I were friends from around 1996 until his death. I've been friends with his brother-in-law since high school days. And when I moved to Toronto, I was often included in Markell's Shabbos dinners and other holiday celebrations. Dan and I never lived in the same city and we didn't see each other very often but dan always made the effort to reach out and stay connected i happened to meet him when i was making some decisions about a relationship and my job at the time dan's capacity for listening and offering sound advice was astonishing his strong values deep connection with his jewish identity incredible intelligence and dedication to his career 
challenge my acquiescence to my life situation vis-a-vis my career and relationship. His very presence in my life brought out my strengths. I think I could have fallen in love with him if we lived in the city or as we joked, our styles of travel were similar. I am a backpacker and he is a planner. As many others have attested to, the members of the Markell family are incredibly warm and loyal. Dan's boys were the light of his life and brought great joy to his whole family. They are being deprived of their grandparents, cousins, aunts, uncles, and many friends that make up the fabric of the Markell community. I miss Danny a lot. He brought a perspective to my life that I haven't found in anyone else. I am grateful for the time we spent together, and I hope this trial brings some peace to him and to his family. Sincerely, Julie Kristoff, Montreal, 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 Montreal. Oh, I'm so tired. Thanks, guys. Canada. What a beautiful letter. Have a fantastic night, everybody. Please hit the thumbs up. Share this episode, and I will see you back Saturday. But may, if, and if I'm going to live stream tomorrow night, the 2020 episode, I'll be on Kick, which is a live streaming platform. I think a little bit like Twitch, but I can live stream the whole thing without getting pulled there. And we can hang out. I'll put the, if I choose to do that, I'll put that link in my community tab. And, but otherwise, I'll see you back Saturday, 6 p.m. Eastern. Have a great night, everybody.